Echinoderm Week, let's talk Echinoderms. These are some of my favorite invertebrates. I really like these guys. Uh, I hope you will too. We got lots of videos. We got lots of interesting stuff. Let's uh, plow into them and let me turn on the subtitles. Yeah, me. There we go. Okay, so there are five living classes of echinoderms. And uh, these are class in the taxonomic sense, as in kingdom phylum class. So they're uh, the five main divisions of uh, the echinodermata. Echinodermata name means uh, echino is uh, something like a hedgehog, and dermata is skin. So uh, yeah, spiny skinned or hedgehog skinned. And you can see they're all kind of spiny. And even uh, this bat star, I think if you were to pick it up, uh, yeah. It's got a little bones in there and it's uh, surprisingly rough. If you get a chance to go down to the Shreveport Aquarium, they've got a nice touch tank and you can uh, see some of these bat stars down there and actually interact with them, which is pretty cool. Okay, so there are five main classes and they are the, and so you wanna, you wanna memorize these right up front. You wanna have a good command of these because I'm gonna be talking about them throughout the rest of the uh, lecture as if we all understand what we're talking about. So <laughs> let's get on that same page uh, right from the start. So uh, they're gonna start over here at crinoidea. So this is a crinoid. They're also called feather stars or sea lilies. They're just another echinoderm. And so these guys have branched arms and they'll have some multiple of five and uh, they'll all see how they divide up you got one branching into two, and then sometimes those two are going to branch into four, or something like that. That's how they work. Um, there are some that have a stalk, and there are some that do not have a stalk. And so these are, we think, the most ancient surviving branch of the Echinodermata. And they have a fossil record that goes all the way back, uh, pretty near to the Cambrian. And there were some other weird things at the beginning, and we will get to those. Okay, so that's crinoids, or the class Crinoidea. See, that's easy. Now, asteroid, you think of these as coming from outer space, but aster uh, means star. Yeah, and you know, you rearrange the letters and yeah, it is star, or maybe stare. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know, call them starfish, call them starefish, whatever you want. Uh, these are uh, right over here, asteroidia. And they have um, this interesting feature where they can actually lock their muscles. So like for you to lift something and then hold it in position, you have to constantly be sending signals to your muscle. Your muscle has to be constantly tensing and retensing and maintaining that tension. It takes a lot of energy, really wears you out. What a starfish can do is it can lock its muscles in any position and it doesn't require any further energy it is just going to be absolutely rigid in that position. They do this when they're about to eat something. They will lock themselves uh, down onto it and then just mercilessly digest it. Uh, they're pretty cool little guys. So Asteroidea are starfish. There we go. Next one are called Ophiuroidea. Ophiuroidea are the brittle stars. But uh, as I'll show you, they should probably be called the badass stars. They are essentially the same kind of thing as a starfish, uh, kind of a similar architecture, except that everything is encased in a layer of bony armor. They are just fantastic. And uh, some of these guys are scavengers. Some of them, though, are ambush predators. We will see a video later where one of these things reaches out and pounces and demolishes a little tiny squid. Uh, for the uh, squid fans out there, that's going to be a tough one. I don't know. Yeah, maybe a little triggering, but we will see. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, Ophiuroidea, uh, very, very interesting. And so they're going to have this central disc and then five little wiggly arms, wiggly muscular arms uh, that come out. All echinoderms have these things called tube feet, and you can see some running along the bottom of this guy, which is a sea cucumber. But the Ophiuroidea actually uh, uh, lock up a lot of their tube feet inside of a little armored pod. So they are now mobile spikes. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, part of how they hunt. So yeah, Ophi Ophiuroidea, the brittle stars. Next one are Holothuroidea, and these are the fancy name for the sea cucumbers. So Holothuroidea, hello sea cucumber, there we are. And that's these guys. They are stretched out. They have all the same parts that you would find in the other groups, except 
In each of these, the animal is very careful to leave very little gap between its armor plates. These are all very carefully armored animals. And the Holothuroidea just go the opposite direction. They have little tiny uh, evolutionary remnants of those armor plates, but they're just sort of floating in a middle layer uh, just underneath their skin. So they're not really attached to anything the same way that they would be in uh, one of the other things. They're basically an evolutionary remnant. And so that lets these guys be the flexible, bendy, squishy, stretchy, flexible uh, members of the family. They're very good at burrowing, and uh, yeah, everybody else goes for a sort of an armor approach. Uh, these guys go for stealth, and then they will open up and filter feed for the most part. Uh, so they're pretty neat. And you get some of these holothuroidea down extremely deep in the ocean. And then the last group are going to be the Echinoidea. These are going to be things that we would call a sea urchin, and there's a lot of really interesting kinds of these. And uh, Echinoids are, um, yeah, are just wonderful. They have these spines on the outside. Each of those spines is not fixed. It's actually hooked up to some muscles, and they can wave them around and actually kind of walk along on them. They'll have tube feet that'll stick out uh, about as far as the spines, and that also helps them move food around and potentially move. And they'll have these other uh, little organs called pedicellaria, which are going to be like little snapping jaws all over the surface of some species. And that's just to keep other uh, little predators and parasites away. They're pretty cool little things. Very spiny, very dominant. Whenever something interrupts the uh, ecological balance, for example, in the Mediterranean or up in Alaska, when we take away the fish or their predators, these things multiply without end and just scrape all the other life off the rocks. Sea urchins can wreck pretty much everything else. Starfish, same sort of deal. They are uh, almost apex predators uh, for the coral reef, if you think of it that way. Really interesting creatures to study. Okay, so how do these things actually hook up? Well, there are a couple theories. And they come from different areas. Uh, one is going to be uh, based on... Uh, so they're all based on interpretation of the DNA evidence and interpretation of the way they grow up. So like looking at the embryos and seeing at which point they're all the same and then at which point, you know, one differs and then another differs and then another differs. Something like that. So we think that crinoids are certainly the oldest group that's still around. There were a lot of older groups uh, than this and they have all died out. And then sharing the stage about the same time as the crinoids were these things that kind of looked like brittle stars. Um, they were similar, and we think those are the common ancestor of both brittle stars and starfish at the very least, but also perhaps the common ancestor of uh, echinoids and uh, sea cucumbers up here. And so depending on whether you think they come out one at a time or whether there's two major groups uh, that uh, sort of spring out of each other, that's how you can divide them, but uh, yeah, so we're still trying to figure out which of these two is actually more correct. And again, it's the lack of a lot of full-length genome sequence data for this group that really makes that process difficult. So let's look at their little babies, because their little babies are fantastic. Okay, so here are the uh, different groups over here. There's our standard examples. And then look at the little tiny larvae. Um, and so uh, these little larvae uh, have different names depending on the different stage. Uh, a pluteus is uh, something like this, a little sort of spiky thing. But look how the larva of the sea urchin resembles the larva of the brittle star, like really, really resembles. And so you can think of a sea urchin as just a brittle star that doesn't have those five arms, or rather has those five arms wrapped up and integrated into that central disc. So it's like just the central disc with the five arms stapled around the sides of it, and you've pretty much got an uh, echinoid. And so they, they're uh, very similar embryologically. Now look at the holothuroidea and the asteroidea. These guys are going back to an even older school, and it's a similar sort of thing. I think if you rotate this upside down, then you get a shape that's fairly similar to what you've got up there in the uh, echinoidea. Um, and uh, same thing down here, but they're in the same orientation as each other. And so these are uh, also, this is maybe an older type of embryo. And then the oldest, oldest type, uh, this one's actually turned around sideways, but if you rotate it around to the front, you'd see the resemblance with um, a, a starfish or a, a holothuroidean. This seems to be the ancestral type. And so there's a couple ways that uh, evolution has branched out from there. 
and we're expressing either sort of older, you know, styles of uh, embryogenesis, or we're expressing like the new modern updated style uh, on different groups. But uh, yeah, these things uh, clearly share a, f a common ancestry. Uh, and then these are the little larvae uh, a little bit later. So they're going to undergo great metamorphoses. They'll uh, go from just a couple of cells to um, early evolution, uh, to early rather developmental stages that resemble what you would see in a human embryo, um, up through gastrulation. Uh, and then at that point, we kind of take a turn off and uh, echinoids go their own way, but they are widely used as a model for developmental biology, particularly for the early stages because you can get these guys to release just millions of eggs and sperm and you can fertilize them and they develop really fast. So it's very conducive to working inside of a lab. Um, anyway, they go through a couple of metamorphoses uh, into this form, sometimes into a second larval form. And then here is a sort of a late larval form as they're starting to develop this. So you can see that at the start, they have bilateral symmetry meaning you can draw a line down the middle and you've got symmetry on either side. They definitely don't have five-fold symmetry, but as they grow, each of these groups is going to develop something like five-fold symmetry. So here you can see on the brittle star, it's a little bit later and it's starting to grow. There's the, going to be the uh, five arms coming out of the uh, central disc. That's what we're doing, and you'll see a similar stage at uh, one end of each of these uh, larvae. That's going to be important. What they're doing is they're showing you the way that these things have evolved. They start out as a bilaterally symmetric creature in the earliest uh, fossil record. And as we move forward, um, the modern versions generally have something like five-fold symmetry. But remember, it's not really five-fold symmetry. What it is is bilateral symmetry still, because you can draw a line right down the middle of a star, and you have the same thing on either side. And even though it looks like it's five-fold symmetry, there are actually some parts. Like there'll be a part uh, where the anus comes out and there'll be um, a couple little pores where it'll release its uh, babies. And those are not going to be exactly symmetrical. So it's kind of a, you know, if you zoom out, you could make the mistake easily of saying they're five-fold symmetric when really they're not quite, but they are approximating it. Okay, so let's look at some of the uh, little embryos and the way that they develop. So uh, here we've got our crinoid, and so there's our little crinoid, and this is the uh, Doliolaria lar larva. See, it's got that little uh, tuft of cilia on top, like a crazy little baby chicken. And it's got these bands that run around the middle, and uh, each one of those is going to have little cilia on it. And so you remember our um, uh, protostomes. They had those, uh, some of those had those trochophore larvae with a single little band of cilia around them. Well, look how much cooler these deuterostome larvae are. These guys have five bands of cilia or three or four bands of cilia around there. They just, yeah, <laughs> they are some of those protostomes times two to five. So there we go. Um, here is the uh, early stage in the holothuroidian. So we're going to go from the eight cell stage and they'll use the same sorts of colors to just mark where the cells are coming from. So when these cells at the bottom divide, the cells that divide and end up at the very bottom down here are the ones that are going to form the bottom of this thing. And then the blue cells are going to end up forming the entire top of the embryo. And uh, then we're going to push in one wall of the embryo. This is the uh, stage called gastrulation. And since these are deuterostomes, they are going to make the mouth second. And so the first little hole in this little gastrula is going to be our anus. And the second little hole is going to be the mouth. And so there's our little baby anus, and there's going to be our little baby mouth uh, on there. And yeah, we've got a little tiny digestive tract, and it's kind of cool. This is a far more radical, I would say, uh, metamorphosis than we would see in insects. They're more familiar. You would tend to see them on land. But uh, let me tell you, if we were <laughs> if we were making children's stories a little better, uh, it would be the very hungry echinoderm. Uh, <laughs> For sure, yeah. Get rid of that caterpillar. That's that stuff is passe. Um, anyway, uh, further development, and here you go. You've got your little larva, and then this is the uh, view of an actual one. And depending on species, they'll be a little bit different shape. But uh, this is the kind of generalized plan showing you where everything is and ends up. 
And so all those cells from the bottom are going to end up forming in the middle, and these are eventually going to become the cells that actually form the hard parts of the organism. So it's going to have little tiny baby bones inside it, which is really cool. And then this one, instead of developing five little bands, is going to develop two very wiggly bands that go all the way around, and I guess actually connect up into one. So that's just one giant band of cilia uh, is the way you could interpret that. And so this thing is going to be able to move around. It's uh, very well connected. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's got wheels. Over here's a crinoid. So we've got very primitive uh, development, but same sort of deal. And you can see at some of these early stages, it really resembles the larva of uh, holothuroid. So by some accounts, crinoids are the very first uh, branch to develop that is still extant. And uh, these may be the last branch to develop, the holothuroidea. But you can see that they're still pretty much going off the same playbook. And so that's the early larva of a crinoid. Um, then the late larva of the crinoid is what turns into this. This is uh, the front view. This is the side view of the same thing. So uh, imagine this part rotated, like rotated around to the side, and then that's what you're seeing. That part right there is this part right here. There we go. And so its little mouth is going to be right there. Its little anus is going to be up there. And they're going to have a little uh, sucker pad on one end where they're going to anchor themselves down uh, if they're a crinoid. Okay, I'll go a little more quickly through some of the other groups. So these are the other guys. You've got your asteroid, you've got your ophiuroid, and we've got your echinoid. So asteroid starfish, ophiuroid, brittle star, echinoid, um, uh, yeah, sea urchin, thing like a sea urchin. And you'll see that they are really similar between the asteroids and the ophiuroids. Uh, they're little uh, youthful forms. They've got these little spines. This is the uh, embryonic skeleton. That's what uh, these little bars are. And you can see it uh, running right through the middle of there. And so these are the first organisms on the family tree that leads to us that have something equivalent to our bones. So the skeleton is made out of cells that uh, were in the mesodermal layer of the embryo. So here's our little gastrula. And these cells start out at the bottom, they bud into the middle, and then they are the ones that are going to eventually form, uh, differentiate into the cells that actually make the uh, skeleton, uh, skeletal elements. The difference here is that the skeleton of an echinoderm is going to be made out of very light, almost bubbly calcium carbonate in most cases. There are differences and the sort of harder, higher use wear areas are going to be a little bit firmer, different composition. And they've got some tricks. They can actually uh, um, change the composition of the calcium carbonate and form little patches that work like lenses. So this is armor that you can see through in some cases. Uh, really cool skeleton. Something that our skeleton does not do very well. We have an actual hole in the front of our face uh, where our eyes are so that they can actually see what's going on. But uh, yeah, wouldn't it be nice to be protected and be able to see everything? I think it would. I think it would. But you can see a very similar stage uh, here at the gastrulation point, uh, and uh, it's not just the drawing. And then after that, you've got a couple of different things you can do. You can, this is a sort of laying down version, which is what the brittle star is going to do. This is a sort of upright version, which you can see a lot of similarities. The cilia band is going to run around all of these little tiny arms. And uh, this is the one that's going to be the uh, sea star or asteroid. And then over here, you've got your echinoid. And they don't have the really cool drawing of the echinoid. Or rather, I had to cut it off to squeeze this onto the page. But there's a lot of similarities uh, with these other things. So yeah, very similar early stages. And then in the later stages of development, they really take sort of left turns from each other and end up with different appearances. Here is uh, shown a little. Um, so this is an echinoid, uh, Heliosideris, and this is looking at its early little embryo. So here we are. So this is uh, kind of, actually, this is kind of like a middle-aged embryo. And there is the point at which it's going to first start developing that pseudo five-fold symmetry. And you can see the three at the top are kind of big. The two at the bottom are a little bit small, and your line of symmetry would be right down here. And that's going to be preserved throughout the uh, life of the organism. But there will be times when it uh, does appear to be uh, kind of symmetrical. And then it's going to go through a couple more changes. It's going to start growing that little internal skeleton. So it's just like a sort of a squishy bag now. These are going to be the first five little tube feet. And so there they are, the first five little tube feet for moving around and eventually passing Ooh. food into the mouth. And then, yeah, there's our first little uh, um, skeleton forming. 
And the skeleton, remember, is mesodermal. So all the parts of the sea urchin, all the hard parts, are still in the middle layer. There's a skin over the surface of them, and there are um, various internal organs on the inside of that skeleton. Okay, and that's the end of that one. This is just to introduce the concept of echinoderms, and I think we've done a good job on that.